ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure for Barnes & Noble to be hosting this very special tribute to Michael Hastings. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the format of this evening's program. We have several friends, co-workers, and admirers here who will step up to the podium and share their favorite anecdote about Michael. In addition to this, our guests will then participate in a panel discussion on a topic obviously not at all foreign to him, journalism. These panelists will be available to meet with the audience after the program concludes. The panelists are John Avlon, Editor-in-Chief of The Daily Beast, Marissa Buchanan, NBC News producer, Dave Cullen, author of Columbine and a freelance journalist, Matthew Farwell, writer for Rolling Stone, Alice Gelber, professor at Kennedy School of Government and NYU Journalism School, Ali Jarab, freelance journalist, John Ness from WNBC, Lucian Reed, documentarian, Eric Bates, editor at First Look, The Intercept, Ruby Kramer, correspondent for BuzzFeed, Will Dana, executive editor at Rolling Stone, Jack Gray, senior producer at CNN, Anderson Cooper's 360, Elise Jordan, wife of Michael Hastings, and Jeremy Scowl, investigative reporter for First Look, The Intercept. Here to act as the MC for tonight's program is Ben Smith, who is Hastings' last employer and editor-in-chief at BuzzFeed. Since joining the company in January 2012, Ben has built a newsroom of over 150 reporters and editors, led expansion of over 20 content verticals, and built teams across the world. He has written for publications including the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Slate, the New York Post, and the New Republic. Ben will join us on stage in just a moment, but first, a short audio clip from the book. Introduction. Why I write. My name is Michael M. Hastings, and I'm in my 20s. I'm sitting in a studio apartment on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, second floor overlooking Orchard and Rivington. There's snow dropping by the streetlights. It's 3 a.m., and I just got off work. My magazine has a policy, a little item in the 57-page Human Resources Manual called the Outside Activities Clause, it prevents employees from publishing journalism without the magazine's permission. That could apply to writing books like this one. So I want to say right now, this is fiction. It's all made up. This book is a story about the media elite. Maybe you're interested in that world. I have the CCs and the BCCs and the reply alls. Three years worth, from 2002 to 2005. Time and place specific, a very recognizable New York, at least for now. I do have themes, too. Love, in a way, though it's not my love, and I can't say I understand it too well. Not murder, at least not in the whodunit sense. No ghosts or supernatural horrors or serial killers. Sex, yes. I have a bunch of sex scenes. There's war in the backdrop looming and distant and not real for most of these characters, myself included. Maybe I'm talking genres, and maybe the genre is corporate betrayal, including the big decision that the entire media world is so interested in, who and what is left standing. It'll take me about 300 pages, approximately 85,000 words to get to that. By turning the page, you're one introduction closer to the truth. Thank you. Thank you guys all for coming. I'm, I'm Ben Smith. Um, very few reporters have kind of real fans of their own, I think. Like most people, you know, read us for what we're writing about. And Michael, I mean, is, I don't know, as, as the turnout here shows, as well as having, you know, people who really loved him, had people who recognized and, and followed his voice and his byline, um, you know, which is kind of a very unusual and amazing thing. Um, he was one of the, the great journalists of, of our generation, no doubt. Um, he's fearless and had a, a nose for conflict and, for, and really had figured out how to make people care and make Americans care about the issues of power and life and death that the kind of cliche is that Americans won't read about. Um, he covered the great Ameri he was He had this idea that there were three great American beats. I don't know, some, he had, Eric probably told him this. Um, he, uh, and one was politics and one was Hollywood and he had written wrote powerfully about both of those, but I think his, his most powerful work was 
about war and peace, including uh, expose in Rolling Stone of how the military leadership in Afghanistan saw the civilian leadership that really changed the course of the US involvement in that war. He also had a novel in his desk drawer to the surprise of many of his friends, including me, that was about the media, but it was also about these same themes of power and life and death. It is, among other things, very good. Even the, uh, the New York Times has something nice to say about it today. Um, and, and that's what we're here to celebrate. Uh, but first, I think we're going to see a video montage about Michael. And so my last semester at NYU, I got an unpaid internship at, uh, at Newsweek. Uh, basically, I was working for free for about three months. Uh, Luckily, I'm Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. And so I'm still working for free. Uh, Ten years later, my career in journalism has, has not progressed much at all. But, uh, you know, there was a heat wave that summer. My apartment didn't have air conditioning, so I was in the office a lot. They thought that was hard work hired me, uh, and then, you know, asked to go to Baghdad a couple years later, and, and that's when I uh, started doing the overseas segment with the Baghdad correspondent for two years. Tell me what I got to say. Yeah, uh, just say your name, right? I have your unit, um, say hi to whoever you want to, okay. and then when you hope you're going to be home. <laughs> All right. All right. What do you think of Baghdad? Baghdad. There's nothing really you can say about Baghdad. It's... Glad we're here, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Should have sent us here a little bit longer ago, that way maybe we didn't have to get extended. Hey, what's up everybody? I'm specialist Dan Guerin, stationed in Baghdad, Iraq, 24 years old. Wow! Cut! <laughs> I'm 26! <laughs> uh, I gotta tell ya, it's been awesome. It's been fucking sweet. The words can't describe the satisfaction you get of busting in the home of an Iraqi taking away their only means of defending themselves, and then um, giving them a fucking $2 lock <laughs> while insurgents roam the streets preying on them. And sometimes it'd be details, say, about a death squad, sometimes it'd be details about something else, but the stuff that I was most interested in never actually made it into the magazine. When I decided to leave Newsweek, one of the things I wanted to do was capture all those details, and, and one of the first big stories I did was, was for GQ, where I went out to this outpost uh, on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan with this a group of 20 guys. And, uh, and talk about people who never, no one ever listens to, the, the, the average soldier, the private and the specialist, he lives his life not being listened to. I'm sitting atop a fighting position at a border checkpoint along the Afghan-Pakistan border. Um, we're here with a field artillery unit. They haven't been out here in a while. So the idea behind the story of General McChrystal that I always had was, well, no one's ever really hung out with these top-ranking guys and sort of told mm -hmm. it like, like, uh, like it was with them. And uh, you know, so so that's what my sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Should he, I, I, you know, should he have been fired? That was, you know, President Obama's decision. And I was awakened about, uh, I think it was two in the morning. And I was uh, told there was a problem, that the, the Rolling Stone article was about to come out, and it was bad. As difficult as it is to lose General McChrystal, I believe that it is the right decision for our national security. The conduct represented in the recently published article does not meet the standard that should be set by a commanding general. One of the sort of interesting aspects to the story, and, and you touched upon it in your question. I mean, in, in the sort of questioning period here, um, I was the only one you asked, should you have reported the story? You know, that was the question you sort of, you sort of posed to me. And, and that was a response that a number of other journalists uh, had as well. Um, and to me, it, it, what it illuminated uh, was this sort of extremely cozy relationship that, that, that many in, in my profession have established with, with very powerful figures, and how much they cherish that relationship and the idea that anyone could threaten that, uh, you know, causes great, great concern. So, so the most sort of vicious kind of attacks I always get are from from my my, my colleagues. Yeah. Is this going to prompt uh, the military in general, the commanders in Afghanistan in particular, to be more wary of journalists? Of course, because you, 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 what you see is not what you get. Clearly, you've got someone who's making friends with you, pretending to be sympathetic, pretending to be something that they're not. And then they're taking what you say. When you start an article with General McChrystal making obscene gestures, you're not even using something that he said. If, if General McChrystal was not a powerful person, if he was a, a leader of a gang and I wrote down what he said, no one would have been on, t on CNN saying, hey, wait, was that off the record? But I think what I've tried to demonstrate, and 